Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is the third video on June 22, paper 42, and uh, let's start discussing question number eight, nine, and ten. Now, starting with question number eight, the role of sensory receptor cells in mammals is to detect stimuli and generate action potentials in sensory neurons. Human taste buds on the tongue contain chemoreceptor cells. Different chemoreceptor cells respond to different chemical stimuli. Figure 8.1 is a diagram of a chemoreceptor cell in a taste bud. So you can see the tight junction, then Y, then support cell, then chemoreceptor cell A, and then sensory neuron B. Now it says name the structures in region Y. Now what are those? Those are microvilli. They're just the infoldings of the cell membrane. So if this is a cell, then this will be the microvilli. This is one cell. So microvilli, or we can also say brush border was also allowed. Uh, though I don't agree with that, if that was allowed by Cambridge. So just the reason for the tight junctions. You know, the tight junctions are these where the cell membranes are attached. These are the tight junctions. I'm just going to color them in yellow. This one, this one, this one, this one here, this one here. This sort of two cell membranes are very closely attached. They're called tight junctions. So just the reason for the tight junctions between the chemoreceptor cells, no movement of uh, ions between the chemoreceptor cells. So there should not be any movement, and that is why the two cell membranes are very uh, tightly attached to each other. Of course, it's also another reason is they don't allow the movement of the channel proteins uh, in the PCT. So no movement of chemicals between the cells. In part C of the cell is a very direct question. Chemoreceptor cells A respond to sodium ions in the salt. Describe how the contact of cell A with sodium ion can result in an action potential in the sensory neuron B. So basically you've got to understand how uh, it will go. So sodium ions will enter the chemoreceptor cell A. Cell surface membrane will be depolarized. This is the receptor potential and the threshold will have to be crossed. Calcium channels open, calcium ions enter, uh, vesicles move and fuse with the cell membrane, exocytosis, neurotransmitter binds to receptor on the B membrane, and sodium channels open, uh, sodium will enter the sensory neuron B, postsynaptic membrane will be depolarized, and a threshold will have to be crossed for all this to happen. So basically it's a seven mark question, it's a very direct question. Either you know it or you don't know it. There's no sort of thought about it. It's just something which we had to memorize and uh, write it down. Part C of the cell sodium ions enter uh, through the microvilli or the channel protein and cell surface membrane depolarized. A receptor potential is required and this threshold has to be crossed. Calcium channels open. Calcium ions enter the cytoplasm. Vesicles move and fuse with the cell membrane. Exocytosis of the neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitter binds to the receptor on neuron B membrane and sodium channels open, postsynaptic membrane depolarized and a threshold needs to be crossed. So this is how we had to answer this uh, question. Now coming to question number nine. Ultrafiltration in the kidney takes place between the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule, the afferent blood vessel. So this is the afferent blood vessel and then you have the glomerular capillaries and then the efferent blood vessel. So you have afferent which is entering and efferent which is exiting. So A for afferent and E for exit or efferent. So this is the one which is going out and these are the glomerular capillaries. So the afferent blood vessel carrying to the glomerulus has a wider lumen. This has a wider lumen than the efferent. Efferent has a narrow lumen. Explain why the lumen of the afferent needs to be wider than the lumen of the efferent blood vessel. Well, why? It's very simple. To generate high blood pressure or hydrostatic pressure so that to force the fluid or the plasma out through the basement membrane into the Bowman's capsule. You see, when the efferent uh, lumen is smaller, so there's going to be a back pressure created. Just like when you're watering the lawn, your plants, you press the pipe and that creates a high pressure because you see now 
the water coming in the back is coming at a larger volume and is exiting at a smaller volume so it ex ex exits with a lot of pressure to generate high blood pressure to force fluid through the basement membrane into the Bowman's capsule. Then coming to figure 9.1 is a diagram of part of the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. Blood capillary you can see here, the lumen of the Bowman's capsule you can see here and name A and B. So what was A? A was the basement membrane. So A is the basement membrane. You can see this is the area which is the basement membrane. So, and then B, what was B? B was the protocyte. The arms of the protocyte wrap around it. So they were showing you the protocyte. And this is, of course, these are underlined. So you couldn't have said anything else. These, all these word, if it's underlined, you have to exactly use the same words. Otherwise, you won't get the two marks. There are two marks for this. Then part two, describe the roles of A and B in the formation of the glomerular filtrate. What is it? Basement membrane acts as a filter. Only molecules less than 68,000, 70,000 uh, mm can pass through. And the podocyte has gaps in it or slits in it. And it allows the filtrate to pass into the lumen. And podocyte produces, sorry, produces the basement membrane. The podocytes also produce the basement membrane. So role of A and B A is the basement membrane acts as a filter. Only allows ions, molecules less than 68,000 can pass through, or you can say red blood cells and large proteins cannot pass through. Podocyte has gaps in it or slits in it or pores in it, which allows the water to pass into the lumen or the Bowman's capsule. And also the podocytes produce A, which is the basement membrane. So A being the basement membrane acts as a filter, only allows ions and molecules less than 68,000, 70,000 can pass through. Or you could have said RBCs and large, uh, large proteins cannot pass. Then B is a podocyte, has gaps or slits, allows water or filtrate to pass into the Bowman's capsule. And also the podocytes produce the basement membrane. Now coming to the last question. So there's now always going to be 10 questions in the paper four. The African penguin Sphinxus demersus lives along the coast of South Africa. Figure 10.1 shows the African penguins. Oh, I like them. One way of estimating the size of a population of African penguins is to use the mark release recapture method. Suggest so three assumptions that must be made for the mark release recapture method to be valid. Marking should not be harmful. Uh, there's a constant population size. There are no immigration or emigration or migration, emi, emi, migration. And there is sufficient time for the marked individuals to mix with the rest of the population. And the fact the penguins are mobile. So you could have given me, it says, assumptions that must be made. They move, they, 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 they are sort of not stationary. They are mobile. So marking should not be harmful or should not should not be able to be removed. They cannot be washed away by rain or, you know, when they just lie down and they rub in the mud or something. And there's a number two, there's a constant population size. There's no immigration, emigration or migration, sufficient time for the marked individuals to mix with the rest of the population and the fact that the penguins are mobile. So we are assuming all these things. It says suggest three assumptions that must be made for the mark release recapture method to be valid. Assumption means what are we going to assume? We're we assuming that the marking that we have done is not going to be rubbed off because you have to mark them and then release them and then recapture them and then count them. And there's a formula by which we then calculate the uh, population size. Then coming to the next part of the question, the international uh, union, the B part of the question, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, red list of threatened species has categorized the African penguins as endangered and could become extinct. Poor things. Suggest reasons why the African penguin has become endangered and could become extinct. Well, they're usually the same. Loss of habitat, climate change, predation, competition for food, new disease, pollution, Numbers get so low that population can't recover. 
so loss of habitat climate change predation competition for food these four points you should remember whenever there's such a question you just write that now new disease what does that mean you see like just like covid killed millions of people so if there's a new disease among the penguins and, and that kills hundreds and hundreds of penguins, well, that, of course, would result in them becoming endangered because very few who are resistant to that new disease would be able to survive. Then pollution. What if there's some chemical waste which is being discharged there and that is killing or their oil spills? And that oil spills are going to wash onto the beaches where these penguins reside. So numbers get so low that population cannot recover. So this was the next point. So these are the general points which we talk about any endangered species and of course not specifically penguins but any other endangered species as well. Now coming to the figure 10.2 shows the estimated number of African penguins in the year of 1800, 1900 and 2000. So 1800, 1900 and 2000 calculate the mean yearly increase in population size of the African penguins between 1900 and 2000. So then we had to know this value here in 1900 and then in 2000, so in over a period of 100 years, it said the mean yearly decrease. We want the yearly decrease, so whatever the decrease was, you have to divide it by 100. So 100, this is uh, 1500,000, this is 200,000, this is 1300,000 divided by 100 would be, uh, 13,000 would be the answer per year. Got it? 1500,000, 200,000 is equal to 1300,000 and 1300,000 over 100 is equal to 13,000. The African uh, penguin is a member of the kingdom Animalia. Outline the characteristic features of the kingdom Animalia, which means we have to tell us what our features are. So whatever the Changar features are, we can give them multicellular, eukaryote, cells, tissues, organs, heterotrophic nutrition, there's a nervous system, we have cilia or flagella, and we are mobile or motile. So generally it was any four from these uh, features of animalia, kingdom animalia, the number one, they are multicellular, uh, all animals are multicellular, they are eukaryotes, and they're made up of cells, tissues, and organs, like unicellular would not have any tissue and organ. Then heterotrophic nutrition means that they cannot make their own food like plants are autotrophs. Heterotroph means that we eat ready-made food and we have a nervous system which is very, very well developed. Then we have cilia and flagella and we are mobile or motile. So any four out of these and now that completes this paper. That is question number 10 done. So that finishes this paper and thank you very much and uh, thank you for subscribing. And thank you for uh, watching my videos. Thank you very much.